Welcome to our December Humanities Happy Hour. So glad we have such a good crowd for these amazing journalists that we get to talk to. Um, I am going to, in a few minutes here, just kind of get out of the way. We have four amazing panelists. Um, and so to give them as much time as possible, they are kind of moderating themselves and you will get to see their storytelling skills, their interview skills as they talk to each other and kind of pass this conversation around. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn it right over to Gwen Florio to start us off. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you also to Humanities for sponsoring this. This is really cool. Uh, and thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, so I have spent most of my adult life in traditional newspaper journalism, although that's changed a lot over the years, uh, until recently or most recently, I was editor of the Missoulian. Um, I left in October and I had about a minute of wonderful retirement and <laughs> then things started happening. So I'm now going to be teaching a course at the journalism school in the spring semester. And I'm doing some freelance, uh, freelance writing and editing. And I'm also working on a couple of different novels. So it got busy fast. Uh, Courtney. <laughs> You're muted. Hi. <laughs> now I'm talking. Um, my name is Courtney Kogel, and um, I have um, a sort of cobbled together journalism career over the last 20 years. I started in journalism as a high school student working for the Great Falls Tribune's teen panel. So that's where I first got my first hit of journalism, so to speak. And um, then I went to I went to the University of Montana. Um, where I now teach. Uh, I am the director of media and engagement for the School of Journalism and uh, an adjunct professor. And I teach several courses on uh, mostly writing and reporting, but I also oversee the legislative news service, which uh, covers the legislature every two years for about 200 news organizations across the state. Um, it's done by students and published by professionals. And it's a really wonderful partnership and it's my favorite thing to do every two years. Um, before that, I freelanced, and before that, I uh, worked for the Associated Press and um, PBS NewsHour while I was while I was or P PBS uh, Media Shift while I was freelancing. Um, and uh, in between all of that, I also started a farm with my husband. And now we we have a small farm. Um, we grow grains and have a small farm to loaf bakery. Um, so I have I what uh, I think writer Courtney Martin calls a portfolio career, which sounds a lot better than cobbling everything together. I have a bunch of different irons in, in a bunch of different fires. And before that, I started uh, in 2005, I started a magazine called New West, um, which was uh, an online magazine um, with some print components. We covered the Rocky Mountain West. It was me and a, a former professor of mine, Jonathan Weber, and that had a very short but exciting life, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Thanks for having me and thanks for being here. And next up is, I think it's Erica, right? Erica, are you next? Yeah, I can be next. I'm sorry, I'm a blank screen. <laughs> I got a new computer, which was, uh, which is good, but I don't obviously know, don't know how to work the camera, but um, I'm uh, Erica, I'm the, um, I'm a, former arts editor from the former Alt Weekly newspaper, the Missoula Independent. I was um, the arts editor there for 10 years and I did freelancing for them before that. And uh, currently I am a freelance writer, um, but I also have my own projects that include um, the Garden City Beast, which is a low circulation local zine. And um, and then I am also the co-producer of Death in the West podcast, which is um, a podcast that um, is, our, our first season is on the death of Frank Little in Butte. Um, and we just finished the final episode, are working on the final episode this week. Um, I'm also a contributor to the Montana Free Press, which, which is a, an independent nonprofit news and um, analysis source. So those are what I'm working on now. Um, Laura? Great, 
Thanks, Erica. Um, I'm Laura Nelson. I'm an agriculture journalist and farm and ranch photographer. I'm based in Big Timber. Um, I've been here for the last eight years. Um, five of those have been as an independent contractor and freelance journalist, again, mostly focused in agricultural writing. Um, before that, I worked at our local newspaper, the Big Timber Pioneer here, which was kind of an accidental job. Although I went to journalism school, I never thought that I had what it took to be a real journalist. Um, and so through a different string of events, I ended up moving to this uh, small town. I grew up in a rural community in Nebraska, but moved to Big Timber to take a job as a um, weekly news reporter. And about um, two to three months in, my editor took a different job and kind of just left me the keys and said, good luck. <laughs> you're in charge now. Um, and so I, um, that was one of the more delightful experiences, although very, very challenging um, to learn kind of a different kind of journalism or a different kind of journalism than what I had expected. Um, and it led me down a path to be really proud to say that I'm a journalist, even though that was not a, not a title that I thought that I wanted in my younger career. So um, what an honor to be here with three women who are real journalists and um, have just such admirable careers and that I, I just really respect. So thanks for um, Humanities Montana's for hosting this. And I'm going to jump in and say, if you're doing it, you're a real journalist. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so let's, you know, welcome to the fold. Um, my first question goes to um, Courtney, because you've had such an incredibly varied career and really kind of gone through a lot of the iterations that journalism itself has gone through. And what I wonder is how, um, how if and how you've seen the role of women changing through that time, and, and if so, how? I have, um, for sure, I think we all have, especially um, those of us watching the media, we can see it now um, in the leadership in just about every news organization in the country. Um, and you know, it, my answer to that question is sort of um, as varied maybe and as scattered as my career has been, which is that um, when I first started in journalism, um, it, my, my, I thought my path was gonna be very linear. Um, so I had, you know, big plans to, um, um, to be, to be a you know a, a a journalist who rose the ranks. So I started at Lee Newspapers covering the Capitol, and um, right out of college. And um, then after that, I had plans. I was gonna get to D.C. Um, I did an internship at a magazine in D.C. I planned on covering Congress. It was going to be this very linear path. And then 9/11 um, happened um, in my junior year of college. And um, all of the internships dried up and the news business really collapsed. And that was kind of one of the first um, times in recent history that media really um, can, you know, collapse on itself. And, um, and so my path became a lot less linear than, it, than I thought it was. So I went from Lee to the AP and um, I was at the AP for a short time. And again, I was like, okay, this is gonna be what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna keep climbing, I'm gonna get there. Um, and then I really started missing Montana, and most of us do, right? What I'm a boomerang kid, I think that's what they call us now. I left, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm out of this one horse town, I'm never coming back. Um, and you know, a few years out, I was like, oh, I miss Montana, I need to go back. There's big stories to tell there. And, um, and so I got a call from one of, my, one of my former professors at the University of Montana, and he was like, let's start a magazine. And I was like, okay, when can I move? So I uh, left that job and came back to Montana. And then from there, my career really bumped around, right? So I did that magazine for five years, and then I got pretty burnt out. Startup years are like dog years, I say. Um, you age seven years for every startup year that you're, that you're doing it. Um, and so by the time five years rolled around, I was pretty burnt out. And um, especially at the time, online media was really intense. Um, and so that's when I quit and started a farm. Um, and then I freelanced and did like web design work and all sorts of other things. And I've used my journalism in every single iteration of my career, whether it was inside of Big J journalism or not. And I think that is where um, the real beauty is of what women's role in journalism right now 
um, is, is that it can be anything. It used to be that in order to be a woman in journalism, you had to be, you know, um, you know, the on, on the masthead. Um, and now it's like, you can be a really powerful woman in journalism by making a badass podcast like Erica did, you know, or by starting your own thing. And so there are so many multiple roles and multiple paths that I, um, I find that really heartening as a woman and as a woman who has little kids and a bunch of different things going on. Um, I like that I can still be involved in this industry and this, I call journalism a practice more than an industry, really. I mean, it really, and we can get into that a little bit later, but, um, but this uh, discipline, I mean, journalism is a discipline um, that uh, I love that I'm able to be part of it in a way that I feel is making a difference, but I get to do it on my own terms. And I don't think that that would have been possible 20 years ago when I was first starting out. I get to do it from Power Montana. My husband is in the bakery, um, you know, of half a block away and on the same property. And I just took a walk on my 30 acres and now I get to do this. So I think there's, there are some, um, there's some lots of ways that we've backslid when it comes to promoting women in journalism. And there's lots of ways that we've really leapt forward. And I think that um, I'm biased, but my situation I think shows one big leap in that you can do this work and be a storyteller and be in journalism. And, and it doesn't have to look exactly the way it did 20 to 25 years ago. So that's that. Um, what about you, Laura? Um, can you talk a little bit about your jumping around and how you've seen, you know, your role as a journalist? Because I'm interested in knowing more about why you think you're not a journalist. Because like Gwen said, you're totally a journalist if you're doing it. If you're seeking truth and holding power, the powerful accountable and telling stories, then you're a journalist. That's what I say. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Courtney, you made so many interesting points there that I really appreciate this idea as journalism as a practice and, um, and being able to see so many different facets of the industry. And I think that that was my hesitation that I didn't feel like um, I was a journalist because I had, I, I had this impression that journalists were supposed to be these very aggressive, bloodthirsty agitators, right? Like we're, we were, we're like the angry snarling watchdogs of society. And that just, while I appreciate that that's an important role, that was not um, congruent with who I am, right? And I guess, as I came into rural community journalism, and again, I grew up in a rural community, I grew up in a small town. Um, as I came into rural community journalism, I got to see this part of journalism that um, is more filled with empathy and compassion and gentle, more a gentler storytelling, if you will, um, and, and recognizing that journalism can be both. And it's not an either or, but it's a but and, and that we can be assertive and seek truth and do that with compassion and empathy, right? And that we can call out wrongdoings, but that we can also spotlight good and beauty also. And that that's both of those things are our jobs. And that's what is really compelling to me. Um, and, and I also love, Courtney, something that you've said in a conversation with us before, um, we both have this connection with journalism and agriculture. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on, is there a connection between those two things in your walks of life and, and um, in, in agriculture and food and journalism and storytelling? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting question and one that I have to sort of justify sometimes to people because they'll be like, wait, you do what? You're a farmer and you're a journalist and you're a, you teach journal? I don't understand how that works. It's hard to describe my situation to people sometimes. Um, and, uh, the, and, and I so I've worked hard to try to find how it all fits together because it really does. Like it really, um, it, it does actually fit together. And for me, I'm a big proponent of local news. Um, I think that, and if, if you look um, at the stats right now of where trust in media and news is, it is like seriously tanking, but trust in local media 
is up. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, and so there are some, and, and the same is true for food. We're, I mean, let's be honest, we're at an all time low for trust in all institutions right now. Government, higher education, uh, the media, all the things, right? Um, but there are some bright, and food, right? <laughs> we're also, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of distrust in kind of in food too. And what I see the correlation is that I realized that the two issues that I work on, which um, primarily are local news and local food, um, that they have a lot in common, that people are willing to um, put their money where their mouth is um, and put their money where their eyes are, um, so to speak, that um, people are more likely to trust their local news organization, they're more likely to trust their local food source. And so I think um, this resurgence and this kind of um, resilience to overuse that word, um, in, in local systems um, is really promising from both a news standpoint and from a food standpoint. So I see, I see some correlations there. Yeah. Um, I wonder yeah. if Erica would have something to share about that, about local news and, and her work with her, with the, with the, her zine. Yeah. Erica, have you seen that? You, you know the hunger firsthand, right, for local news. Can you talk about that? <laughs> Yeah, can you can you hear me and see me now? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Great. I'm just hi. on my phone. <laughs> Super. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess um, as I was trying to set this up, I guess so. The question is about um, the the local news part of the zine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. what's the like? Talk us through like the hunger of for local news. You are a local news provider, and. Um, you've obviously met an incredible demand in Missoula. So talk us through like what you see that demand being and how it's grown and how you've met that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, once I didn't, once I, uh, the independent closed and I didn't really have um, the, that same access anymore, I just wanted to have a project. And so I started this zine, the Garden City Beast, that was really just, I mean, you know, it's, you can't fit a long story in a zine. So it was, you know, a experimental um, in, you know, it was friends that wanted to contribute. And so it was like the editing on it was pretty small. And I started it actually because Big Sky Documentary Film Festival asked me to do a zine for them. Um, and so I just did kind of a selection of reviews and got some other writers on board to do that. And they paid for the printing, um, Big Sky Doc did. And it was fun because, um, even though like uh, as an editor, I'm really, you know, it's, it really bothers me when, you know, there's errors and um, I worry about that editing process. With a zine, there's kind of a charm to not having that. Um, and so like even in the, in the one with the Big Sky Documentary Film Fest, when we, we printed it and there were some errors and then we, you know, wrote in the edits and then reprinted some of them. And so it had these like little handwritten notes and things in it, which gives it this sort of, I guess, um, uh, charm and there's like an artistic kind of feel to it. And I was really um, excited about that, sort of pursuing that a little bit. Like I had to let go of, you know, the intense editing process or the idea that I could ask a lot of people who were just giving me content for free. Um, but but I, um, but as I've gone along, I've also realized how um, great this sort of hyper local, you know, there there's kind of like an exclusivity. That's not too exclusive. It's just that there's there aren't a lot of zines that I could publish, so it felt like a nice little souvenir when people got one of those. Um, and then you know, eventually, uh, I think it was maybe with the first one, um, some friends of mine and I put on we we did a, like a live performance of the zine, so we um, read. Um, movie reviews or these short movie blurbs and we um, I think we yeah did a, a live Q&A with a band um, and it was special because it was if you came that night you you got to see it but otherwise it wasn't you know it wasn't like you could just pick it up somewhere it was a very um, particular experience um, and I think there's a little bit of um, pull for that but also I really like the idea that 
um, you're kind of, it's like, know your farmer in the same way. It's like, know your journalist or know your writers. So you get to kind of think about like, um, you know, this isn't just like a faceless writer. You can maybe even trust them and, and trust what they're trying to do and their accuracy. And that's obviously we all know is kind of a struggle in the news world right now is figuring out how to um, gain trust of your readers. So, Erica, one of the things that I remember the first time that I saw your zine is that, um, I don't know if you remember, I, I emailed you afterwards and said, I hope you don't mind. I'm using it also as a coloring book. It's so fun <laughs> to interact with, with this in a different way, right? And I loved your comment on it also being a live performance um, and having a different component to how we interact with news. And I wondered if Gwen had some thoughts and comments on kind of the evolution of how we interact with news in different ways over how, how that's changed over the years and in your career and how you've seen we interact with news and information differently today than we might have 10 years ago or, or at a different time? Well, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things I loved about working at the Missoulian in a, um, in a newsroom in a small town as opposed to a big city like newsrooms I'd worked in before is people would just walk in off the street <laughs> and say, here's a great story, which sometimes it was. Actually, more often than you would think it was. Sometimes it was kind of out there. Um, or they call and say, hey, there's this thing going on. Why aren't you there? And that's, you know, a fair amount of our news literally kind of came in over the transom. And, and that relationship with the community is something I really miss. Um, once social media um, became more prominent, people started interacting with us on, on social media, not always in the nicest ways, <laughs> but again, you know, it's their opinion and they would append many, many opinions to stories we posted on Facebook or we tweeted out. So it's another way to sort of take the temperature of the community or at least a segment of the community. Um, I think those are kind of the bigger ways for a long time we had comments on stories so you could go on our website and make a comment there. And we eventually disabled those. And I think that was a good thing because you had a very few people uh, kind of dominating the conversation and frequently not in the healthiest way. And again, and anonymously, that was the part that was really troubling. What surprised me was when we went to posting the stories on Facebook and people had to use their real names with the comments, they went right ahead saying the same nasty things. So uh, that's just sort of a sign of our times. Uh, one thing we had started to do with the Missoulian and, and partly through humanities is doing some um, outreach about news to the community. I think in general, news organizations don't do well about um, getting to know their community on a more personal level. And so uh, we talk about, I know there's a, a program through humanities on fake news, just trying to educate people on what fake news is, uh, how to avoid it, you know, how to do a little truth telling when you're looking at your news source. And then the pandemic came along and kind of shut things down. And um, now we're moving into Zoom, which is a good way to do it. But that sort of face-to-face -face interaction just got cut off and that's really hard. Um, I want to go back to Erica for a minute because she's jumped into this brave new world of podcasting and I already see uh, Bruce Wittenberg has called out Death in the West for the very excellent podcast it is. And I just want to know how you got into that. Uh, I cannot imagine how time consuming the process must be to make just such an excellent product. Uh, it's been written up in the New Yorker and Rolling Stone, if I'm not mistaken. So I just want to hear more about Death in the West because I'm a huge fan. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I got into it because um, I, I'm like a lot of people very um, into listening to podcasts and sort of um, really like the audio part of that and the textures that you can get out of that um, into a story. But I... Um, and I always had ideas, like everybody has an idea for a podcast. But then I ended up um, 
you know, talking more with my brother, uh, Leif, who's a historian, and um, Chad and Zach Dundas, who are brothers, and they are um, journalists. And we, we all just were kind of thinking about, I, I think Zach had been thinking about a, a story, you know, doing a, uh, a book about um, Dashiell Hammett. And Dashiell Hammett, of course, wrote about Butte at one point, um, calling it Poison Bill in his novel, Red Harvest. And we kind of started talking about that and decided that we really wanted to um, explore the story of Frank Little, who was lynched in Butte in 1917. Um, he's a union organizer. Um, and so we just decided that we would just go for it as an audio story. We were all interested in trying that but all of us are print people. And so <laughs> we, I think we went into it knowing it was gonna be hard, but of course it was still hard. <laughs> um, even though we were prepared for that part, um, I think, you know, we realized you have to be really economical with your language in a podcast because mm -hmm. you have to, you have to have shorter sentences. You have to, um, give some space for pauses, you have to give space for music. Um, and it's so different from being able to write a long form story, for instance, which is what, or even, you know, for Chad and Zach who have written novels or um, full books and have a little more space. So um, we kind of, I mean, in some ways we've learned the hard way and that we have scripted, uh, it's a 10 episode um, story and we've really over scripted it. And we've had to cut, you know, we had to go in and cut back and cut back and we had to learn that, you know, uh, you know, when you're a reader reading a long form story, you can kind of jump back and say like, oh, who's this person they were talking about again? And in a podcast, people don't really do that. You can, but it's not as easy. And so there's a lot of signposting that has to happen. There's a lot of, um, you know, having to say like, hey, remember when we told you this and remind people. Um, and it's just a different way of telling a story, um, but super fun and, um, and we had to kind of learn how to tell a story, have four people tell a story. I think all of us are used to, definitely used to telling, you know, um, tackling a story individually, usually. Um, so when we're scripting it in Google Docs, we're, um, you know, all kind of uh, helping to write certain sections of it. And my brother, the historian is, you know, pulling together um, archival audio and we're doing interviews. Um, but it's just, you know, stitching that story together is, is just, is just so, so different, but, um, but has been very fun. And I think we have very high expectations for ourselves as far as production goes. And I am sort of surprised how well it sounds. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty happy with that part. I think we, you know, Chad Dundas did a especially good job on working on, um, on that. And um, so we sort of had high standards and we didn't meet them, but we met them well enough that people are excited about it. Really, and Erica, I loved what you said about um, that podcast might have a little bit more texture. Just It's just a different kind of storytelling. And I know that Courtney and Gwen have both had different careers also of different types of media and storytelling. And I'm curious for all of you, all of us are freelancers in some different level. And I'm curious for all of you, what inspires you to keep writing and telling stories when you don't know for sure you're going to have an audience always <laughs> for that story. Or, you know, Erica's trying a new way of telling stories and not maybe all the way sure how that's going to turn out. What what inspires you ladies to keep finding stories to tell and new ways to tell them? Huh, I can just jump in. Um, luckily so far my freelancing has come to me. So uh, that's helpful. Although now I'm, I'm pitching some things. You know, I think the thing that has always inspired me over the years it's just people are really interesting. You know, you talked about that when you first spoke, when you um, said journalism doesn't have to be kind of hard edged aggressive. It just has to be curiosity. And I've always felt like if I see something and I go, okay, that's interesting. I want to know more about it. Uh, my readers will also, you know, other people will. And every time I've had that thought and I've ignored it, 
some other damn journalist has gone on and done that story. <laughs> so I really learned to pay attention to it. And I feel like I could never run out of ideas because um, there's just always one more interesting thing. And I'm, I'm gonna throw out an example of local journalism. Uh, there was the story in the Missoulian by Seaborn Larson this weekend about the um, gentleman who was killed down by the river. And that could have been a very straightforward uh, crime story. You know, it was horrible. It was an awful crime and, you know, here's the facts and that's that. But he talked to the nurse, I think it was, who found the man's body and the effect that had on her and how the, she then found people who knew him, humanized him tremendously, humanized her uh, brought out sort of a, a community outpouring of, of empathy for this man and really humanized an awful situation. And to me, when I see journalism like that, I'm just, I'm so happy because that's, I think, the best of it. And that's the best of community journalism. So it's a wandering answer, but that's what inspires me. That's a great answer. And I'll, I'll build off of that because I think it's um, one of the, I, I don't write a whole lot anymore. I don't write a lot of big J journalism anymore. I do some small J journalism here and there, but um, uh, but but mostly I'm working with students now and um, to see them light up. So when they come to me, when they're 18 and 19 and they, they're, they, I'm, you know, I, I get them at the beginning and at the end. So I get them in, in the beginning first class, news writing 107 or 170. And then I, and then I get them, you know, often at the end. And um, when they first come in, they're like, I don't know how to find stories. That's one of the first units that I do is how to find stories. What is news? What's news judgment? And um, it's less prescriptive than they think it's going to be. And that kind of scares them. Um, and at first, they can't find a story anywhere. And then they do, they become Gwen. <laughs> they start seeing stories everywhere. And that is one of the greatest gifts of journalism. And I tell my students this too, again, back to this like idea of journalism as a practice is, you know, they're 18 or 19. They're like filling out their majors. They're like, I don't know. I like to write. I like podcasts and I like YouTube. Maybe I should do journalism. And, um, and they come to us and, um, and then we're like AP style and grammar and, you know, here's the hard, you know, here's hard news. And, um, and they, they often don't know how to square all of that. But then hopefully by the time they get out of there, the number one thing that, that they come out of the journalism school with, I hope, or at least I hope they come out of my class with is number one, the difference between it's and it's and there, there, and there. But also this insatiable curiosity that you get as a journalist. And once it, once it turns on, it's a fire hose. You can't shut it off. You know, like Gwen said, you're seeing it everywhere. And even if you're not doing journalism, um, uh, traditional journalism, or even if you're not doing journalism at all, if you have that curiosity, it's so helpful in life. And there's other lessons too that come from journalism, including like a, a really good BS detector. That's super helpful in all, sort, in all walks of life. Um, so is this ability to hold opposing thoughts in your mind? Um, and that is like a real gift as well that journalism gives you is to be able to be like, oh, maybe I should think about this a little differently, or maybe there's someone else who thinks something differently. Um, that's another one, but that big one is that, that, that insatiable curiosity. Um, and even just uh, one, of my, one of my favorite assignments to give my students is to go sit in a public place. They can't do that now. Um, or maybe they can in some places, um, and listen and eavesdrop and come up with a story that they think is newsworthy and bring it back. And that really shifts their ideas for what is newsworthy because they think that newsworthy is just the car crash or the ambulance. Um, and that definitely is news, but so is this, so is the story of the nurse who helped this homeless man. And I think um, training journalists to see all different kinds of those stories is really important. And also training the public to understand how broad journalism is, um, is also part of that equation is um, we can all benefit from, from, from seeing stories everywhere we go because stories matter. They're what make us human, you know? I wanted to say, I feel like um, agriculture for me, I think, you know, I'll, 
I, I also wrote a lot about agriculture and um, found that it was the perfect sort of feel to bring out all kinds of stories that, um, you know, had human interest angles and um, uh, political angles, there's con land conflict, there's all kinds of things in there. And so I'm really interested to hear from Laura about maybe some of the most interesting stories you wrote or the ones that were maybe surprising to you that you found some angle on it that you hadn't expected. Hmm. That's a really good question, Erica. Um, I, let me think on that for a minute. That's yeah, a, no. a really good question. Um, a, a story that surprised me, you know, I guess that I am, I'm always surprised in the most pleasant way in the genuineness of the people who I get to tell stories about in agriculture. And that's not surprise like, oh, I didn't expect them to be such a good human. I, I, I always expect people to be really good humans, um, almost to a fault. But this um, this very, very deep reverence for um, life and land and natural systems and the way that the world works. And I guess I love agriculture journalism because I find that people who have a lot of time in solitude outdoors mm -hmm. do a lot of introspective thinking. Um, and so I think most of, uh, I have so many just thoughtful and provoking conversations and not that you can't find that all, you, you find that everywhere you go if you ask the right questions and you're curious, right? But um, I am always drawn to agriculturalists, one, because that's my my background and that those are often the people who I connect best with, but also just the intricacies and the complexities of their life and world that's also He's so deeply connected to very simple natural rhythms in the world and I think there is just a never-ending source of stories and inspiration connected to um, what many would call the you know what is the oldest profession in the world is feeding people right um, so that's that's really fun for me and and I know that you've shared those some of those similar experiences as well so I wonder, um, Gwen, Courtney, and Erica, for all three of you, we have, have a couple questions in the question box about the role of journalists in promoting civil discourse um, and how do we renew faith in institutions. Um, and I wonder if that last round of comments and questions almost answers that question, that it's about um, helping people be more curious and more thoughtful um, in the way that they approach ideas and issues. I, I wonder if you guys, I mean, do you agree? Are those ideas similar? Yeah, I, so. I, I would say I teach, I teach a lot of media literacy um, uh, to high school students and even some junior high students. And I will tell you that I, I, I know it's not a silver bullet when it comes to um, uh, the infodemic, can we call it that at this point, that we are really struggling with what is true and what is not um, right now as a society. And um, I have to believe that starting sooner um, will help, that the, I'm a big fan of educating the next generation um, on what is real and what is not and how to be a really smart consumer of news. Um, so I think that that does, I, I do think that it, um, that what that piece that that Gwen was talking about that community outreach and that transparency and what Erica was talking about too um, that you know letting people know that journalists are not these like faceless robots with um, you know who are just in our you know in our basements ready to um, I don't know whatever anybody thinks a journalist is doing <laughs> I guess I'm just making that up at this point but in any case um, but that they're real people and I think that's one of the reasons that local like Erica said, it's one of the reasons that local news um, has a much higher trust rating than um, national or even regional. And you see that um, even in, you know, the small newspapers or the small news organizations across the state. So I live in Teton County and my paper of record is the Shoto Acantha, which in my humble opinion is one of the best in the state. And um, there's a certain accountability that comes from both the audience and the producers of the news 
when you run into those people in the grocery store or when your kids go to school together and when you also sit on the PTA together or whatever. And so um, I think there are models there that could be potentially um, that, that we can learn from in how we dig our way out of this, this kind of hole. So I would say, yeah. And, and that kind of morph, oh, go ahead. Go for it, I was gonna ask you a question, but I think oh, you're gonna okay. answer. Well, hopefully it'll be on the same topic because it kind of morphs into another question that Carla posed about corporate ownership, uh, whether it places strictures on what constitutes a story and I really want to address that because I think there are a lot of misconceptions around it. I don't think it does in the way people think it might. Like in all my years working for newspapers owned by different corporations, nobody from on high ever said, kill that story, write that story this way, so on and so forth. The very dangerous way um, I think it affects it is this constant bleeding of resources like taking away and taking away and hurting our ability to do the kind of journalism that's the most important that is just you know routine government coverage informing citizens about what's happening uh, from the city council, from the school board, from the legislature, although that's actually changing a lot in Montana, thank God. But um, again, making it, we just don't have the resource to, this, to cover things as broadly and deeply as we need to. And that is really, really painful. And that I think is dangerous. But again, it's it's almost more painful because it's not even that intentional. It's like, I don't think they care. They just are looking at that bottom line and not really, it doesn't really matter to them how that's affecting local news coverage. I can, I can give kind of an example of that I feel like people might want yeah. <laughs> an example <laughs> of um, <laughs> when um, Lee Enterprises bought the independent. Um, we, as a, you know, a, a newspaper that, you know, likes to have a voice and be alternative, we, we decided to turn around our, our cover story. I can't even remember what it was, it was supposed to be, but we turned it around quickly and it became a cover story about the enterprises and we dug into their history and we it was really important for us to you know make sure that people still saw us as an independent voice we didn't didn't want to be seen as suddenly taken over um and 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 having our voice being taken taken over um, by the company immediately or something like that and um so we wrote you know the story that was not you know, not a positive image, and um, and we we didn't hear from them. We was fine. They they didn't. It, it didn't matter to them that we did that. Um, so as time went on, and people asked me, you know, like, are you being told what to write? It's the same as what Gwen was saying. You know, I that was not the issue. It was really um, more of this. You know, sort of still being able to have um, the resources that we needed and being being more concerned about that and um, but also being able to let our readers know that 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 was it that we hadn't changed our our it was the same people still still writing the stories there and um, um, even though you know we would hear from people saying oh yeah I can tell it's different <laughs> and it wasn't um, but, but anyway, I just wanted to share that because I know people are, are often interested in how things happened at the, at the independent. I think both of those comments make um, a good point um, that, that I can go back and talk about sort of the lessons of the early newwest.net days. Um, and the, the, the big lesson that we learned, so those were like the early I don't know, the wild west days of like the web 2.0 world. Um, and nobody really knew what was gonna happen, but we had all these, you know, the promises of the early web, whether it was the early social web or the early web, um, were that, you know, that we were gonna democratize media, that, that this was gonna be, um, that anybody who wanted to have a voice could have a voice, anybody who wanted to have a platform could have a platform. And that definitely did happen. Um, but it also created um, a flattening of media, which you're seeing now, I think, um, where it's harder and harder 
to um, for us, there would be, it, it got harder and harder for a startup like New West to make a difference. Um, and we tried all the things, you know, we tried all the fancy, all the bells and whistles and, um, you know, I, the, the widgets and other things that I built for the web um, circa 2005 to 2009 took years off of my life um, and also didn't get us anywhere. It didn't make us any more sustainable. And so the lessons of that early web and the promises of that early web and the promises that, um, that were not met and still haven't been met. I mean, if, you know, let's look at like just the story of social media. We can all agree that the promise of social media has been um, squashed by the flattening of social media, right? And some of the bad things that social media has brought to media in general, but to our society and our sense of what's right and what's, um, what's true and what's not. But um, the one lesson that I learned um, in New West is a, is a lesson that I think all of the other journalists in this, in this Zoom room know in their hearts um, and, and in their heads is that um, the thing that makes any publication successful is always going to be good storytelling, good, truthful storytelling, whether that is an investigative kind of situation um, or whether it is telling stories about your neighbor and the people who live nearby and the stories that matter to your audience. And so, um, you know, one of my, I teach social media and I sort of have mixed feelings about social media, uh, as you probably could tell. And, um, and one of the things that really ticks me off is when um, news organizations, it's very clear that they're just using it for clickbait as opposed to using it to build trust with their readership. And you see it and you know it. I mean, you, when you see the, the headline, you know what it is, you know it's clickbait. And we know now that clickbait doesn't get anybody anywhere, um, that those papers are not making money off of that. They're getting eyeballs maybe, but they are, by, by buying those eyeballs, they are eroding their trust and they're wasting people's time. And so I think um, the big lesson that I learned out of New West is, and I, we wasted a lot of people's times on a lot, on a lot of bells and whistles. And the thing that always um, that always that, that made us that kept us going in the end, both um, professionally and financially, were, were the big holy crap stories. Were the stories that 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 seeped into people's hearts and let us let them know that we cared about these communities. And um, that was a big lesson that I hope someday we figure out how to fully monetize that kind of coverage in a smart way. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I I hope that it's going to happen someday. <laughs> and I would strongly second that. And I'm sure Erica would too. Um, when social media became more important to newspapers and the whole pressure, I think, was, you know, people were just reading things in little tiny bites and you need to make your story shorter. Otherwise, you're going to lose people's attention. And repeatedly, it would be our biggest, most in-depth um, stories, like, again, the one I mentioned this past weekend, sort of the news features or the big investigative pieces that got the most eyeballs. You know, people are deeply curious. And if you if you tell that story well enough and compellingly enough, they're gonna read it. So I wanna point out one thing, this whole topic was to be on women in journalism. And all of us are talking about journalism very broadly. And I wonder if that says anything about where journalism has gone over the last couple decades, four, five, 20. <laughs> we're no longer lady journalists, we're just yeah. journalists, which oh, is great. God. <laughs> uh, Haida has an interesting question. And can we give a shout out to Haida, speaking of young, awesome journalists? Uh, she was in Courtney's class says more than one. Uh, she worked with me at the Missoulian. Awesome. Awesome young journalist. But she says, if you weren't in the journalism writer field, what would you be doing? Have you worked in a completely different field? Well, I work in education and Hyde is the reason I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, students are, um, there's nothing better for me than watching them light up and um, helping them tell their stories. And editing is the same way for me too. Um, I get the same charge that I, I remember, you know, the, the real reason I got into journalism is when I first saw my name in print. Let's be honest, that's probably what most of us first, that's probably what hooked most of us. 
Um, but the second one was, uh, was, you know, was, um, I can still remember my first real like long-term interview with someone where I was like, wow, you mean I can just ask you stuff and you'll tell me things? Like I can just call you? This is amazing. I can just hear people's stories for the rest of my life. Um, that's what really kind of hooked me. And then um, when I got into editing, seeing um, seeing reporters light up about that. And now I get that with teaching um, on a larger scale, just seeing um, students realize that they can make a living telling interesting stories and listening to interesting people is pretty fantastic. Cool. Erica, what would you be doing? Oh, I'm thinking about this and I feel like I still, there's so many things that I want to do. Um, and that's probably why I like journalism because you get to write about so many different things um, and explore different things. But I started, you know, I started undergrad. Um, I went to Lewis and Clark College for a year and I was uh, enrolled in anthropology and I really love that. And I would maybe do that, but um but then I ended up getting, I, I didn't get a journalism degree. I got a poetry degree. So I, wow. yeah, so I, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place and in some ways and then got an environmental studies master's. Um, but, you know, the storytelling has always been just kind of the angle I take on anything. And so I think, you know, there wasn't, I didn't see as much opportunity sometimes in other fields to, to do that, even though they're there. Um, and I, you know, I started at the independent really as a music writer and that was my small little world. And then I had to keep expanding it if I wanted to keep writing there. And then I found myself writing about more things. So that was, that was good, but, but um, maybe anthropology, I don't know. I think I'm gonna start a farm. <laughs> Laura, I, what feel like, I feel like I want to do whatever it is I'm interviewing somebody on at the time that I'm like, wow, that sounds so cool. I want to do that. So like in the last year, I've wanted to be a butcher, a soil scientist, a range scientist. Uh, but ultimately, um, my secondary career choice is and always has been wanting to be in, agri in production in production agriculture. So farming or ranching and what a beautiful opportunity to be a journalist as my primary career right now to get to talk to like Courtney, like you were saying, like to get to go to the most interesting people in the field and say, could you just tell me everything about your life story? How did you do this? How did this work? What went wrong? What went well? What did you learn? And um, that's just, that's fun. <laughs> and how cool is it that, you know, I, I hope that when I talk to people that maybe journalism isn't their career, but that anybody can do that, right? Like anyone can be the weird person that sits and asks 20 questions <laughs> and um, get to learn about other people's worlds and lives. You don't have to be a journalist to do that. So Jeanette has a, a question in here. Um, she said, I'd like to go back to the idea, um, women journalists versus just journalists. I question if women have really reached parity with their male counterparts. Um, certainly in visual media, there's still an emphasis for women on how they look. Um, any thoughts from, from you ladies on that question or, or that comment? Well, I would say that, um, that I think we have reached, I don't know, we've, we haven't reached parity, um, but we have reached, I will say that uh, the, I'm seeing kind of the next crop of journalists and we're overwhelmingly female, um, which has been really fascinating to watch even over the last five years. Um, that the seems that something has, has tipped there and I'm not really sure what, but I'd love to hear from Gwen about um, sort of some of the, um, yeah, some of the harassment that you have had to deal with as a reporter and as an editor and whether or not you think it would be different if you were not female. I think it would be a lot different. And I think the main difference is guys get a lot of harassment too. Any, anybody gets a lot of abuse today online if someone disagrees with you. 
and journalists, because of the position we're in, people feel free to take pot shots. And that's always been part of the deal. Um, I don't mind criticism. What I do mind is, and especially this is what happens with women. Guys are told, that's what you wrote, you're a jerk. Women are told, that's what you wrote, I wanna rape you and kill you. And I'm not exaggerating. That happens over and over and over again in far more graphic terms. And, um, and for, especially for women covering sports, it is grotesque. Um, and I don't quite know what to do about it the way I handled it, because people say, don't ignore it, it goes away. You're just, you know, egging them on if you, if you I wouldn't respond to them, but I started posting some of the notes I got and just saying, yep, here's today's mail. And um, people would call them out, which was really gratifying. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're sitting in your basement typing the nasty note, it's another thing if your nasty note is up there for the world to see and people know that's the kind of person you are. And some people did, um, you know, people with way better tech skills than I, on one of the, the scariest ones I got, someone uh, tracked down who it was and sent me the person's address and he lived around the corner from me. So that is a nasty fact. And uh, what I tell young women journalists is be ready for it, get tough. When it crosses a line, call the cops, uh, which I had to do a couple times and I know a lot of women have had to do. Um, so that's, that's the downside. Um, the upside is there are, as you said, I think people going into this business are overwhelmingly female. And that's been the case. I mean, even back in prehistory, when I went, <laughs> about half of us in my classes uh, were women. And what would happen is you'd see, especially as you started um, going along through your career, especially when women had kids, they would just drop out. This business is really unforgiving in terms of the sort of nine to five job that daycare centers are built to handle. Um, that I think is happening less now. You see a lot more women in management. Uh, when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, there was a row of glass offices where the executives sat and we had, they were all male. We had a very rude name for, <laughs> for that row of offices. Um, but now you see way more women in management. The other thing I used to see was the guys in management were all married with stay at home wives and the women were all single, the women who made it to management. And I think that's not the case as much anymore. So there's hope. Um, I've had fabulous women mentors throughout my career. And I think that really helped a lot. You know, I had people I could look up to and, and emulate. And um, I hope that I'm able to do that for younger women in the field. So we're, we're coming up to the end of the hour. We have another great question um, in the chat about, um, about the allure of journalism as storytelling, um, which makes me think of a TED talk that I just heard by um, Jad Abumrad from Radiolab. And he talked about how he ends a story and what he's looking for for a conclusion. And he kind of talks about the formula that he uses for his podcast. But I wonder in our last couple of minutes as we're kind of wrapping up here, um, if you can talk about how you end a story and I'm going to drop a survey in the chat for our audience to tell us what you think of this program. And we'll, we can go over a few minutes if you guys have time to stick around. Um, but if we could kind of end on that note, how do you end a story? Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, uh, a kicker is what we call it. You're looking for a kicker. You're looking for something good, something that, la that leaves a lasting impression. And uh, everyone is always wants to tie it up with a little bow. In summary, blah, blah, blah. But that's not how you end a story. Um, I like to tell my students that you end a story the way you leave a room. Um, you want to leave, a, like if you, you don't want to leave an overpowering scent of perfume, but you want to leave a hint of yourself so that you're lingering a little bit in someone's mind. Um, so you're supposed to, I tell them, use it like you would a cologne or a perfume. Just a little, not too much, leave an impression and get out of there. That's, that's my advice. Wow. 
I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I, I always tell people that the, it's so easy to tell someone else how to do it, um, that the kicker is as important as your lead, the first one or two paragraphs. I will try, especially with a longer story, to try and bring it back to the beginning in a way. In the beginning, if you pose a question or a situation and, and then kind of reference that again, I think it gives readers a sense of, you know, not maybe tied up neatly. In fact, I think one of the best stories I think I ever did left a really big question at the end. I wanted people to be really questioning what they thought about that situation. And I was gratified when my dad wrote me and said, man, I thought I knew how I felt about this at the beginning of your story. And in the end, I just don't know at all. It was about kids sentenced to life without parole. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do want there to be a little bit of, you know, we've gone on a journey and, and we've fulfilled the pro, uh, promise that we gave you in the lead. I, I, I like um, all of those answers and I, I have a harder time thinking of um, how to broadly address that, but I can say, you know, sometimes it's, off, I mean, a lot of times it'll be like, I'll be talking to somebody at the beginning of exploring a story and realize they just gave me the ending, um, you know, and it, you, you just kind of hear it, you know, sometimes it's like, um, in the case of the, the podcast that I do um, with Frank Little, which is a, about this one person, but it, it ends up, you know, broadening to this larger story about a town and, and about the country. At some point, you know, you know, you got to bring it back to another, to maybe, I, I mean, I think somebody else just said this, but to maybe back to the beginning again, but in a different way and a different angle on it. And so, you know, uh, for that story in particular, um, I remember having a conversation at Frank Little's gravesite in view with somebody who had a really emotional uh, sort of attachment to Frank Little and, and said it really well. And I thought, this is something you save for the end, you know, you, you just, you wait, it's like this, this um, thing you can't start with because you, you got to get through the story to get to it. Um, it's like this um, thing that won't make sense or be as powerful until you get through the story. So, I mean, that's just a very specific thing, um, but I like what both Gwen and uh, Courtney said about it in a larger way. Yeah, I feel like all three of you have been much more eloquent than I will be in, in this thought, but I agree, Erica, there's always that moment in the interview where you say like, oh, this, this is it. This is what makes it make sense um, to me. And that's usually what I end a story with is like whatever that moment or that thing was in the searching and the seeking truths and the asking questions and the getting to know someone that made me think, that's what makes it make sense to me. And to me, that feels almost like an exhale, like the end of the story should be a <sighs> That is fabulous. This conversation has been so great. Um, I know we could go for another hour, um, but it's, it's dinner time. It's dark because it's Montana in the winter. Um, so I'm gonna let everyone go. Um, I hope that people can join us again in January, we have another uh, panel. It's called Why It Matters, The Purpose of Protest. So we'll, we'll keep doing these Zoom kind of happy hour conversations and we hope everyone uh, signs in to, to keep going and talking about these important issues. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our panelists. You guys are wonderful. Um, we'll definitely be looking for your bylines and finding what out what comes next. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thanks, Thank Sam. Thanks, everybody. So nice to see you all. Yeah, same. Bye. Bye. <laughs>